What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Sponsored by peer-run support communities, Freedom Center, The Icarus Project, and Portland Hearing Voices. Madness Radio can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network and is online at kboo.fm slash madnessradio. Welcome to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. Today my guest is Maxine Sheets Johnstone. She was a dancer in her first life and is a philosopher now in her second life. Maxine is an independent scholar affiliated with the Department of Philosophy at the University of Oregon who has publications in more than 70 arts, science, and humanities journals and has authored nine books, including The Corporeal Turn, An Interdisciplinary Reader, The Roots of Thinking, The Primacy of Movement, Putting Movement into Your Life, and The Phenomenology of Dance, which has now been published in a 50th anniversary edition and is considered a classic in the art of dance. So welcome to Madness Radio, Maxine Sheets Johnstone. Thank you very, very much, Will. It's a pleasure to be here and quite an honor also. It's it's really an honor for me because there are only a handful of philosophers. I'm not much of a philosopher myself. I did study a bit of philosophy in, in school, but there are only a handful of philosophers who really excite me and inspire me the way that you do. And so it's really a wonderful opportunity to have you on the show, and it's really an honor to have you. If people are not familiar with your work, I encourage them to just um, dive in and you will find a very, very interesting perspective that we don't hear um, often about um, what the mind is and what consciousness is. And on Madness Radio, uh, we often are up against um, assumptions of a kind of a, a neuroscientific or mechanistic neurotransmitter biological understanding of what consciousness and the mind is and how the brain works and the brain being the, the origin of of mind and really that has led to a lot of misunderstandings about human experience and what it is to to live and grow and to suffer as a human being and so your work really provides a very very different perspective about that and I'm, I'm so I'm very excited to have you on the show and talking about what is consciousness and, and what is the mind and so why don't we why don't we get started and if you could just tell us a little bit about your own um, writing of the phenomenology of dance, because you really had to kind of go against the grain of how dance was being written about at the time. Is that right? Oh, quite so. I was considered actually a heretic in the department of dance. My doctorate was in dance and philosophy. A political science professor whom I saw at, at some kind of gathering asked me what my uh, doctoral studies uh, were in, what areas of studies they included, and I told him that I was getting a, a, a doctorate in dance and philosophy, and he said, he said back to me, how is that possible? One has to do with the mind, and the other has to do with the body. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It really surprised me, because I hadn't made that kind of distinction, and in addition, people actually within dance, too, were dismayed with what I wrote. Um, but I just will mention this uh, at the other end of, of, of the journey of finishing my doctorate called The Phenomenology of Dance. And after getting it published shortly afterward, a very, very well-known dance historian wrote a review of the book and began the review by saying something to the effect that the first thing to be said about this book is that it's it's uh, most unfortunate that it was published. <laughs> and the last thing that she said was that it would set back the study of dance for a hundred years. So it's really funny to me that there's a 50th anniversary edition since it uh, at the time was was not very well accepted or appreciated in, in the very, very beginning, but it's, it's, it's has certainly grown since then. It considered a classic, and it revolutionized the way of thinking about what dance and movement are and how to write about them, because at the time when it was written, it was more about objectifying and turning dancers into objects moving through space, and then you asked the question, what is actually the experience of dancing itself? Right, and, and quite particularly investigating and analyzing the actual phenomenon of movement 
because the typical ways of talking about movement, whether it was in the dance class or wherever it was, is that movement is a force in time and in space. And the thing that I discovered in the course of doing a phenomenological analysis was precisely that movement creates its time, space, and force. That's what makes it distinctive in terms of the difference between waving your hand when you're waving goodbye or waving somebody to be quiet. Um, there's a uh, movement creates its own qualitative dynamics. I would like to just mention something about phenomenological methodology. It's a very rigorous methodology in which you start in by what's called bracketing or putting out of gear or, or putting aside any kinds of assumptions or preconceptions that you have about the phenomenon that you're going to investigate. So in terms of, of movement, you have to put out of gear or, or put aside your notion that dance is a force in, in time and space or the common dictionary definition that movement is, is a change of position. And you have to start out in the way it's sometimes described as you make the familiar strange. When you make the familiar strange, you don't have any kind of, of preconceptions that are, uh, that are intruding on your experience. It seems extraordinarily important if we're going to understand something as mysterious as the mind when it's in distress or, or what gets called mental illness. It also reminds me of something that's recommended among Buddhist um, approaches, which is beginner's mind, to step aside from your assumptions about what something is and actually meet the thing itself. Exactly, with bare attention in, in Buddhist uh, practice in, in forms of meditation. I agree with you completely. There's a, there's a similarity between meditative practice and phenomenological methodology. I, I find that, that uh, similarity qu quite meaningful. Because we end up um, relying on received understandings and um, commonplace assumptions that may not actually be serving us unless we go to the thing itself. And and before I ask what it was that you discovered when you um, investigated dance in this way, I want to I wanna find out what was it that really emboldened you to go against the grain of the way that, that movement was being approached um, among others in the academy at that time? Is there something in you that said you have to do it differently or did you have, what was it that, that led you to, to just really hold on to this approach? Whatever was said to me ideationally uh, or in terms of an analysis, it's not as if I balked and, oh no, that's not true or something like that. It's simply, I think, probably a, a matter of my experience that I felt that this was not doing justice to what the actual experience is, to put it in these terms, in these words, that that uh, there is indeed a challenge of languaging experience. And very often people just use ready-made words or ready-made descriptions to, to uh, unpack whatever it is that they're investigating. It makes me think of Carol Gilligan's work about the way in which women's perspective of their own reality has been suppressed and then that's a political act to say no this is actually what I'm experiencing and I insist that it be heard and listened to and I'm not going to let go of it. Yes well it can certainly fit into that uh, perspective also. I have in my own experience been uh, I think singled out in just those kinds of ways in terms of my work. I mean I can relate instances in terms of what People that have, men have said to me with respect to my work den in a denigrating fashion of in one way or another. So I appreciate what you're saying about comparing it to Car Carol Gilligan's work. I don't think that that played in the beginning a uh, big part in the phenomenology of dance because the book was simply totally different from what people were were saying, just totally different. That was in part because phenomenology itself had not reached any kind of, uh, of recognition uh, within academic 
settings that it has that it has achieved today. And then your work from the phenomenology of dance took this incredible expansion into considering what it is to be alive. And you've written very eloquently about mo how movement is the defining feature of life and further that what we call mind or consciousness is an expression of the animated living form and that consciousness and mind can't be understood unless we really look at movement. How did you start to look at these broader issues, including evolutionary biology and, and Darwin? How did you start to look at these broader issues of mind and consciousness out of your investigation of dance? I started that because in my readings in phenomenology, in Jean-Paul Sartre's uh, notion of the for itself, and in Martin Heidegger's notion of Dasein, they're concerned with being, but it just struck me that they're talking about being, human being, as uh, from a deus ex machina perspective. In other words, like humans just fell out of the blue. And that seemed to me a really, uh, that was leaving something out that was just of vital importance. And I was motivated to go back, actually, for a second doctorate in evolutionary biology. I didn't end up completing the doctorate, but I did sufficient studies to really ground my concerns in evolutionary biology. And Darwin, along with Husserl, Husserl being the founder of phenomenology, uh, have been just beacon lights for, for me in my work, just very solid contributors to human understanding. So you, you had you started to read about understandings in Sartre and Heidegger about what it was to exist and to be a human being, but it felt like we had just dropped out of the heavens, that we were just suddenly this exception to nature or this exception to um, natural history. And then you went into evolutionary biology and you discovered a whole different uh, perspective and is that whole different perspective based on the idea that human being is actually continuous with the evolutionary history that actually we arise from previous versions of consciousness and previous versions of of mind in a gradual way that we know is consistent with evolutionary history for the evolution of of, of spe species in general very definitely this is very interesting that you ask that because um I developed that notion from an ontogenetic and phylogenetic point of view. Thinking in movement, what else do animals do except think in movement in terms of whether they're hunting or whether they're playing or whether they're mating, they're thinking in movement. And from an ontogenetic point of view, we come into the world moving and we don't have an owner's manual to read and we don't listen to instructions from others. We discover things by ourselves. Thinking and movement is, is basic to our own lives. Well, when we tend to think of, of thinking, and if you read cognitive science or you read neuroscience, there's this idea that there's this sort of mission control station floating kind of inside the brain, and everything is sort of a reflection of the world, that, that input is sort of received into this brain as an abstract <laughs> kind of plat platonic realm that's up in the kind of the ethers of thought. And this is sort of an assumption that leads us to, to create kind of computer metaphors of what the mind is, that we're operating sof software, we're receiving inputs from the world, and then we're processing the information, and then we're sending instructions to the motor system to move the hand up or move the hand down. And this is a very common understanding of what consciousness and the mind are, and it, it informs all of the mainstream psychology and all of the kind of the mainstream mental health approaches. And so your, your understanding of thinking as movement or thinking through movement is very different than that. Yes, and it doesn't mean that language doesn't develop at all, but it, it does mean that that we come into the world moving and that uh, movement is the source of fundamental concepts, concepts such as near and far, weak and strong, uh, rounded and straight, fast and slow, 
it gives us very fundamental human concepts. Consciousness and language are based on a template of body movement experiences. Is that the idea? Yes, that I in the roots of thinking, I I described uh, uh, in a number of different chapters focusing on different phenomena uh, how the body is a semantic template. What I described as a semantic template. In other words, the body in the beginning gives us is the source of our fundamental concepts. And um, I, I described this in terms of tool making. I described it in terms of uh, a cave art. I described it in terms of sexuality. Um, I described it um, in terms of language, the beginnings of language. And in it, this research, it was not, it was an interdisciplinary research. In other words, it was not, it was, going into paleoanthropology and anthropological, paleoanthropological and anthropological studies uh, and using them as a point of departure for uh, understanding our very beginnings. So going back to the deus ex machina, it, it sounds that that most of the cognitive scientists and, and neuroscientists who are talking about mind kind of describe human language and human consciousness and, and, and reflective consciousness as kind of dropping suddenly, like being a sudden break in natural history. But you're saying that actually that goes against Darwinian notions of the continuity of evolution. And so what, what are your thoughts about the sort of prevailing views that cognitive science and neuroscience take about mind and language and consciousness? One of the things that I really find uh outrageous really in terms of reductionism to the brain are what I call exper experiential ascriptions to the brain that are commonly made by people in neuroscience and in cognitive science where they say that the brain ascertains this or that. The brain, uh, if you see the back of a person's head, the brain knows that there's a person on the front of it or something to that effect. I mean, the, the experiential descriptions to the, the brain, it's as if the brain experiences the world, which is, which is an incredible kind of, of, of uh, pronouncement to make about, about life. Because it's the human, the human body, the animated human form is what experiences the world, not your brain. The whole person or the whole animal is what is experiencing whatever is is the source of the subject of a subject world relationship. I mean, all all forms of animate life have a subject world relationship, and their subject world relationship is either throughout or in the beginning uh, modulated by movement. Can you give us some examples of that, just to really get a clear? sense of that. You, you write um, about how Darwin described emotion as fundamentally uh, movement. Well, yes. In, in his book, uh, The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals, he shows pictorially as well as descriptively in, in uh, linguistic terms, in verbal terms, how there is a concordance between human and animal emotions in terms of the bodily in terms of their bodily, what he calls their bodily expression. But uh, the only reason I say that he terms their bodily expression is because it's not as if the emotion exists first and then the body comes in because the, the emotion is a bodily phenomenon in and of itself. In other words, there's a, an, there's a concordance between the affective and tactile kinesthetic body. That we can see that in the proverbial you touch your hand on a hot stove, it's, it's not as if <laughs> there are two things present, the, the jumping back and, the, and any kind of effective uh, response or pain or whatever. It's, there's a tendency to, to um, carve at joints that don't exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So really this is about overcoming the mind-body dualism that's actually embedded in the very way of thinking that cognitive science and, and neuroscientists are approaching these problems. 
Yeah, yeah, because I find this even in in uh, philosophical uh, circles when people say something about uh, the body tries to stay out of our way so we can get on with our task. It's very, it's very, very divisive, and um, I think that it's not uh, a matter of prominencing the body. In other words, of of uh, saying that there's a, a domination at all, but there's a instead of instead of thinking of embodied minds, which is the disposition of which is rampant to my mind in today's academic circles, we're mindful bodies. There are mindful bodies across the evolutionary spectrum. Uh, and this is tied to thinking and movement. It's tied to the the capacity of of all animate forms of life to form synergies of meaningful movement. There there are really morphologies, uh, differential morphologies in motion. They make their living through their forming synergies of meaningful movement. And this is this is why I consider your work so significant and revolutionary because it's a it's a a commonplace um, among so many thinkers now that look, we do have this mind-body split, and we have to somehow overcome it. But there's not a real attention as you're making to how to get outside of that mind-body split, which is to really see thinking and who we are as conscious beings as being not just embodied, but actually movement is who we are. We're animate form. And so you would consider yourself more in line with the tradition of Darwin than the cognitive scientists and the neuroscientists? Absolutely. But Darwin, as, uh, in, as people should read him in terms of not just hearing about him or thinking, oh, um, you know, descent with modification or something like that, just kind of like uh, a single sentence, oh yes, Darwin, but to really read him, because one of the things too, in terms of the political ramifications of not really reading Darwin, and that is that it's not just the origin of species, uh, but as you mentioned before, it's it's his book on the emotions and the expression of emotions in man and animals, but there's also uh, the descent of man and selection in relation to sex. His second book, which has over, I think, 450 pages on what he describes as the law of battle, which is male-male competition. Because if you really look at male-male competition and see it in light of today's violent world, it's very meaningful and it should be explored and looked at because it's been extrapolated from its origins in terms of mating and, and sexual selection into something quite, quite uh, in and of itself in terms of human violence. Hmm. What, so that's very interesting to me. So what are the implications of looking at it that way? Because I think uh, maybe a more commonplace, superficial reading of Darwin and evolution and that we are animals would say, well, look, violence is natural. Um, get used to it. Survival of the fittest, um, competition and fighting and war is just part of what we are as a species. We just have to kind of put up with it. You had mentioned uh, in another conversation Jung's notion of the shadow. I think it's really important that people take time to look within and to acknowledge the dispositions that they have as animate forms of life. We are not always peaceful, but we are not always aggressive. And there are ways of of understanding our feelings and our dispositions and our understanding that we have a free choice in terms of what we do with how we feel. That's where our freedom lies and our freedom can only be, it seems to me, wisely implemented if we take the time to look within. And taking that time is essential because the Jung's idea of the shadow is that even or maybe even especially people who identify as good or doing good in the world, we have an unconscious side to us that we, we can't kind of see directly unless we really search for it and, and humble ourselves before it because it's often extraordinarily at odds with our <laughs> our ordinary sense of how we are good or how, how we are 
in the world. It's a shadow part of ourselves. And so that there is that choice that we can make to ex- examine that. Absolutely. And I think it's really imperative to do so. And, and that's another way in which, uh, I mean, the, there are commonalities there too between Jung and meditative practices because we can, we can come face to face, confront in a bodily felt sense exactly what our feelings are and, and uh, what our dispositions are. If you're just tuning in, this is Madness Radio. Our guest today is Maxine Sheets Johnstone. Uh, She was a dancer in her first life and then became a philosopher. She's an independent scholar affiliated with the University of Oregon with more than 70 publications in art, science, and the humanities. Uh, She has published nine books, including The Corporeal Turn, an Interdisciplinary Reader, The Roots of Thinking, The Primacy of Movement, and The Phenomenology of Dance, which is considered a classic in art and dance. This has been something that's very interesting to me because I'm thinking about the shadow both as a kind of an inner exploratory process, but also a conversation that in relationship, um, inevitably, especially in intimate relationship, we also see this in groups and teams and organizational work, that in those relationships, the other seems to carry a perspective of ourselves that can see our shadows more clearly than we can ourselves. And so we kind of need the perspective that comes out of that conversation and relationship. We need that in order to be able to grapple with our own shadows and see things about ourselves that we wouldn't be able to see because we're fundamentally relational, conversational, dialogical creatures, not autonomous, self-reflective creatures. I, I agree. I think that, that conversations with uh, dialogues with other people can be extraordinarily helpful. But I think also that in terms of a therapeutic practice, one of the things that really appeals to me about Jung is that he's not ideal, what I call ideologically tethered. And as a matter of fact, I just came across um, a, uh, a quote of his which says, learn your theories as well as you can, but put them aside when you touch the miracle of the living soul. It's really, it seems to me, imperative that uh, in these conversations that we do leave our theories aside and really open to the other. So let's go back for a moment to the conversation that we were having about evolutionary history, because one of the implications of really following Darwin and really studying um, human mind and consciousness and who we are is that language and consciousness arise developmentally through uh, the history of life on earth. And so one of your uh, perspectives, which I agree with, is that actually language and consciousness and mind are found throughout um, life. Can you talk about that and, and, and your belief about that and what that means for us? There are nonverbal forms of language. Um, there couldn't be any social relations among any animals, human animals included, if if movement were not a possibility. I mean, if we were all absolutely still. The, the fact, too, is that if, if you attend to uh, actual experience, consciousness... Uh, Actually, Husserl wrote this in, in one, one of his uh, books, that consciousness is in constant motion. We are indeed, and Buddhist practice shows this too in terms of, uh, of any attention to mind, is that um, it's always moving here and there and looking at this or this idea comes up or that feeling, is a, you're aware of this or that feeling, or it's in constant motion. So paying attention to, to movement is, is, is significant. And the idea that uh, non-human animals, it sometimes it really does amaze me that uh, people who have pets are very willing to say, or some of them at least are very willing to say, well, you know, my, my pet has, is, is intelligent about this or that or has feelings about this or that. But there's not uh, a broad enough awareness of biodiversity and the 
the evolutionary heritage, really, of humans, the lack of respect of wildlife and of our heritage, it seems to me, is really wanting. So all animals have some form of consciousness and some form of language? Social animals have some form of communicating with one another, whether it's, it is through sound or through bodily dispositions and, and certain kinds of, of just kinetic displays. Uh, the other thing about this, too, is that I think it's really important for um, people actually in the brain sciences, uh, neuroscience, to realize that the first sensory modalities to develop in utero are kinesthesia and tactility. And kinesthesia is a, is a totally, practically totally overlooked sensory modality. We usually think of ourselves as having five senses. And then when people in the sciences like uh, Gibson will talk about uh, visual kinesthetic affordances, they give it second place. And though Aristotle wrote about movement as a common sense, that is a common sense. Kinesthesia is involved, I mean, movement is involved in, in other sensory modalities in terms of our eyes moving, in terms of our drawing closer to something to hear it, and et cetera. In terms of smelling, that's a, a movement and tasting, et cetera. Um, but kinesthesia itself is very is is quite overlooked. So in our formation of consciousness and our self awareness, we kind of learn how to be conscious and self aware by moving our bodies and relating to the world through touch and through kinesthesia. Yes. Well, we all come into the world with, as I said earlier, without without an owner's manual. We we learn our bodies and learn to move ourselves. And that's a primary developmental phenomenon for all of us. And in some other forms of animate life, the same is true. It's true of of other primates, for example. And learning to move yourself and learning, just learning your bodies to begin with is quite a developmental process. That goes back also to to, uh, Darwin, it seems to me, in terms of his paying attention to what actually is, not to a theoretical formulation or ideological tethering of some kind, but just paying attention to what is. Uh, You wrote very intriguingly about the process that a bacterium goes through in discerning something in its environment that is noxious and it needs to avoid, and something in its environment that might be nourishing and needs to move towards. And you said that this is kind of like a, a, a very rudimentary form of consciousness, that we also advanced forms or more complicated forms do kind of the same thing. And so consciousness exists throughout um, life. Right. And I think, has, I think that has very radical implications for how we relate to our environment and how we, especially how we relate to maybe indigenous views, uh, which are very resonant with this as an animist perspective of everything has spirit, everything has mind, everything is communicating with us in in some way, everything has some sort of subjectivity in a sense. Yeah, I I agree that that forms of life have this basically approach and avoidance. I mean, that's where it starts is going towards something which is uh, beneficial and avoiding something which is noxious. I mean, there wouldn't be any life forms if that hadn't been a prime of primary concern. In Zen practice, there's a lot of discussion about those being the, the two basic modes of, of experience, moving towards or moving away from, and it kind of moves into a Taoist perception of um, experience as being dual in the, in the sense of the yin and the yang and that polarity, that that's just what constitutes life and consciousness is that you move, a tor- you move towards it or you move away from it. It, if it offends your sense of being alive or it exalts your sense of being alive. There's a tendency in perhaps in our present day American world, or I don't know how rampant it is. I don't know. Uh, I have not studied it, but there's a tendency to avoid one's body, to avoid that it's a, uh, it's something that you have to take care of, but it's not something that you want to really 
uh, pay attention to. And one of the ways in which it seems to me this is so striking is in exercise. People try to get you to exercise, to get out and, and do something physical. And in that typical kind of exercise mode, you don't pay attention to the movement you're you're it's very often there's there's music going on and you go through these exercises the exercises. or there's even a television going on and you watch tv while you're doing your exercise yeah right and there's no real attention to the body at all and i find that that kind of there's no listening and it's in the listening that you learn something about yourself and about movement and about your ways of moving and your style of moving, and you awaken to to the movement of others and the way you move in relation to others. You wrote a very wonderful um, shorter book and maybe more popularly accessible book about bringing movement into everyday life as a as a way of improving health. I really appreciated that you you published that. I actually started writing that um, a number of years ago when I was teaching um, a class for senior citizens in just a long, many, many years ago, and just very taken with the with the fact that so many people go around, they can move their arms and legs, but their their whole midsection is like a static, in-place television screen. It's just very, very interesting the kind of the, of the ways in which uh, people ignore being a body. And this brings us to the question of um, why it is that movement is therapeutic, because I, you know, I often get asked, you know, how was it that I was able to make a journey from being in a very, very distressed and rigid, stuck, difficult place where I, I got a diagnosis of, of schizophrenia, I was in the mental health system, I was getting a disability check, and how was it I was able to, to you know, um, make changes in my life? And it took many, many years, and there's lots of different things that were ingredients to part of that. But one of them was that I discovered uh, my love of, of dancing. And it wasn't just going to clubs and drinking beer and, you know, dancing to electronica. It was going to ecstatic dance and contact improvisation and doing authentic movement and doing uh, movement practices that are much more about awareness and moving, studying yoga and, and, and really bringing movement into meditative awareness and noticing what's happening in movement and then starting to soften some of the rigidities that I had and bring play back in and bring um, a sport back in and just the joy and getting inhabiting what I had been very dissociated from my body and very disconnected from movement. And this was very much a healing and therapeutic uh, thing for me. And, and so tell us about your views about that. Why is, I think one of the reasons that you're um, you know, interested in, in, in moving and movement is because you feel like it does have a healing and therapeutic quality. It can be helpful to people to get in tune with themselves as moving, animate forms. Tell, tell us about that. Well, as you said, movement is gives us a sense of aliveness, first and foremost. And that sense of aliveness tends to be just uh, submerged in, in the plethora of everyday activities. We, we just don't pay, pay very much attention or give it any time or just even think about it unless, unless we feel a pain or we become ill or, or there's this or that to attend to. But the joys of moving are, are, uh, are somehow forgotten, left, left far behind. That's another aspect of, of Jung, which I think is just a fantastic kind of uh, awareness, uh, which is that play really matters. It really... Play. Yes, yeah. Um, I don't remember the quote exactly, uh, it, it's, but it had to do with, with his, his recognition of the importance of, of play, which is an important part of life, we think, in the beginning, but uh, then we think it doesn't have a place after that. But it, it certainly should. And that kind of awakening that you describe, I think, is, is really marvelous. 
And it does take a lot of time if you've been submerged for one reason or another elsewhere. Well, it's so interesting that you mentioned play because I do a lot of, of training and I've learned that in, in throughout society and in, in training in corporations and, and in different organizational contexts and that um, rehearsal, that drama and role play and playfulness are a very important part of the learning process. And it seems that in play, we're able to kind of try out things and explore things and rehearse things in a way that isn't as maybe as risky or as scary or as dangerous as the actual world that we're in where the stakes are much higher. And so it kind of gives us a sense of practice that we can practice at something. I can role play with someone standing up to their boss and saying, hey, I need a, a, a raise and you can have fun with it. And if you can bring that play in and, and that enlivening of that rehearsal, then when the person actually goes out and meets the boss, then they have a little bit more oomph, a little bit more freedom to actually enact what they've been practicing in a, in a playful context, even though they're up against fears or stuck places or um, habits that would be very, very difficult to, to break otherwise. Right, right. That's, that's really interesting uh, because um, one of the things that I do in conjunction with guest lectures where uh, it's appropriate and, and uh, ties in and et cetera, is I do movement uh, movement improvisations with people, not contact, but just a movement group improvisations. And um, one of the things that I that comes up in this, and it's very everydayish, there's it's not class it's uh, very connected. It's uh, because it's it I do it in a very connected way with people so nobody's nobody's uh, in the spotlight or something like that. But one of the things, two things come up very, very strongly. One is that there's a tremendous amount of pleasure that can come just from everyday movement. And the other is that uh, a sense of trust, because in an improvisation, you, especially with people uh, in a group situation um, who are connected in physical ways, uh, even by hand holding, there's a sense of trust that's there, the trust of the person who's facilitating this, namely me, and a trust of the other people who are there, who are participating. And those seem to me to go back very much toward uh, uh, childhood kinds of feelings with respect to learning the world and interacting with people, etc., it also makes me think of traditional cultures and how ritual and music and dance and the playfulness of people coming together in groups and touching each other and being exuberant and celebrating, kind of getting out of their individual space and into the collective space, that how healing that can be and how important that is for building the bonds of a society and connecting everybody with, with each other. Uh I agree with you totally. I really think that there should be a global movement toward including movement in UN kind of, <laughs> of um, I don't know, helping situations. Uh, it really, it goes a long way, especially to, to my mind, because it's nonverbal. It's not telling people to do something as in an exercise class, now do this, now do that. But it's just allowing movement to, to find its way uh, through people's bodies and, and being a uh, communal affair. Um, Maxine, you had written at one point about um, a theory that you had about what schizophrenia is, and you brought your own um, movement, body orientation to that. Tell us a little bit about that and what your thoughts about that are. I think part of it is that uh, the notion is that fear, it seems to me, is a very, very basic uh, emotion for all animals. I think fear is, is just very basic. It goes with this business of, I don't mean that bacteria feel fear in avoidance, but it goes with the approach in avoidance, what is safe and what is fearful. And it just seemed to me that this has some kind of 
it's not something that is learned, but something that does have its roots in uh, our evolutionary heritage. I had read a classic book on the startle reflex by Landis and Hunt that was just really eye-opening, I thought, because their experimental study included not only uh, non-human animals, but people who who had some kind of uh, pathological disturbance. I think there were even schizophrenics in the in the group. Come to think of it, so this was a this was a book that was on the startle reflex. What, what is the tell us about the, what is the startle reflex? They uh, shot a gun, a pistol. So it was a the sudden sound, the sudden sound of a shot, and that startles people because that comes into a silence or even into a modest kind of conversation. That, uh, that penetrates and that shocks people out of their whatever experience they're, they're into at the moment. And uh, that kind of, of uh, the start, what's called the startle reflex, it seemed to me that the whole way in which it's described in terms of contraction, etc., is very much related to fear. Yeah. And um, so that was the that was the uh, starting point for for investigating in schizophrenia specifically because it seemed to me that there were a lot of different theories that didn't connect it with what the descriptions implicitly or even at times explicitly stated is that the person had some kind of fear and uh, was feeling fearful of something whatever it was that really it really resonates um with me because i'm i'm thinking about it, people that i work with and the ways that i work with people and so much of the the kind of alternative approaches that we're that we're promoting really are kind of saying look people have had something happen to them that was terrifying traumatic and they're carrying around a lot of fear these are scared people and so approach them approach us with a gentleness and a connectedness and a, a de-escalating quality that can kind of slowly start to thaw out some of that fear and, and understand that whatever the person that's going through that could be seen as pathological or disturbed, that it actually is maybe a natural response to something that happened to them in their environment that was overwhelmingly terrifying. And maybe it was something that happened in the realm of communication or interaction with family or something that was maybe interpreted or or um, dealt with in a way on an imaginal level but nonetheless it's a terrifying terrifying thing and so people are kind of carrying this terror around this fear this that you describe a startle reflex kind of is just like stuck it's like a chronic fear and um, understanding that i really think opens our eyes about what people need because you just think about what would somebody who's really terrified need? What do they need? <laughs> they need gentleness. They need safety. They need reassurance. They need slowness. Um, I think it, it's a very simple observation, but I think it's very apt and very powerful. Yes, I think that what you're saying is just absolutely, absolutely online, and it's very, very different from so many forms of present-day therapy, whether it's cognitive uh, whether it's behavioral therapy or terror management, or there's a managerial attitude in a lot of therapeutic approaches today, um, and a lot of overly cognitive uh, approaches uh, in terms of just changing your way of looking at something. But it's not really getting into into the well, what you're describing, just the kinds of ways in which you can open the person to what's already there and possible as a resource within the person, him or herself. Exactly. And some, some approaches, I'm thinking of maybe over-medication or medication, you, you interrupt something that may be an actual and not a natural process, and then you introduce this chemical to it that just thwarts the organism's efforts to find its own resources and the organism's efforts to kind of resolve what it's going through. Yes, I oh I I just totally agree with you on that. I mean, the pharmaceutical industry has just in many cases just overtaken any kind of psychotherapy. You get a pill and you can just whip it all into shape. I just wanted to make this one reference, and that is that I don't think that there has to be an either-or here. That um, in a play by William Saroyan, 
a character says repeatedly, there's no foundation all the way down the line. That's a criticism that postmodernists or poststructuralists make toward uh, phenomenology or any kind of essentialist approach. And that pronouncement can actually be made toward postmodernists and poststructuralists who very often cultural relativists because there's no foundation all the way down the line either either for saying that everything is culturally relative. In other words, um, from my point of view at least, we are all human from an evolutionary standpoint. What cultures do is, is uh, rework and shape in different ways what is evolutionarily given. I, I don't think there has to be any conflict between postmodernist and poststructuralist viewpoint and what's commonly called an essentialist viewpoint. I think that that the main thing is to realize that they both exist. Cultures exist. Families exist who shape the individual people in their families. And But there's something basic that unites us all in a common humanity and a common creaturehood, and that's through our evolutionary heritage. So, Maxine, we're just about out of so, Maxine, we're just about out of time. How can people get in touch with this? And also, if you want to just mention some of the titles of some of your uh, books, if people might be interested in checking those out. Well, um, anybody can get in touch with me through msj at uoregon.edu. That's my email address. Um, Putting Movement into Your Life, a Beyond Fitness Primer, uh, is the book that, that you mentioned in passing. Uh, there's the Roots Trilogy, The Roots of Thinking, The Roots of Power, Animate Form, and Gendered Bodies, and The Roots of Morality. There's a book called Giving the Body Its Due, uh, and a book called Illuminating Dance, Philosophical Explorations. That's That was written after the, um, the phenomenology of dance. Maxine Sheets Johnstone, thank you so much for joining us today on Madness Radio. Well, thank you very much for this this great challenge and this great honor to to be to converse with you. Thank you very, very much, Will. You've been listening to an interview with Maxine Sheets Johnstone. She was a dancer in her first life and is a philosopher now in her second life. Maxine is an independent scholar affiliated with the Department of Philosophy at the University of Oregon who has publications in more than 70 arts, science, and humanities journals and has authored nine books, including The Corporeal Turn, An Interdisciplinary Reader, The Roots of Thinking, The Primacy of Movement, Putting Movement into Your Life, the Phen- and The Phenomenology of Dance, which has now been published in a 50th anniversary edition and is considered a classic in the art of dance. That's all the time we have on Madness Radio. Thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, co-sponsored by the Icarus Project, Portland Hearing Voices, and Freedom Center. Madness Radio is hosted by Will Hall and producer is Leah Harris. Madness Radio is based at KBOO in Oregon and can be heard on FM stations on the Pacifica Radio Network. Contact us at radio at madnessradio.net.